that's uh, Dr. Mark Ritson. <laughs> what an honor to have you on the podcast with us today. Um, for those of you who don't know Mark, uh, he is possibly the most famous marketer of our time. Uh, wow, Chris, that's rubbish. That's rubbish. <laughs> I'm quite well done. I'm not, not that famous. I hope not. Anyway, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, it's nine o'clock where he is, so uh, he's, he's having a cheeky Heineken, I think. Uh, it's, it's actually Cooper. Uh, it's Cooper's, which is our version of Heineken down under. Oh, okay. Cooper, Bravo. Sorry, it's uh, better than, I have to say it's better than Heineken, but it's, yeah, very similar. It's a Greek <laughs> can that tastes of beer. In 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 BBC standards, there are, there are other beers are available. Other beers are uh, available. Uh, <laughs> not, refreshment. Not as it turns out in Tasmania at 9pm in my refrigerator. It's <laughs> all Cooper's. <laughs> Well, enjoy the Coopers. But um, yeah, so Mark's been uh, writing about marketing for over 20 years um, and obviously heads up the very famous uh, Mark Ritson Marketing MBA. Um, and previously to that, uh, you were a personal, is it, is it a, a sort of marketing consultant for uh, incredible brands like Pepsi and, and uh, it Ericsson? Yeah, I was, and... a, I was a bit of a strange, I was a, a, really, I was an academic gone wrong they still right. teach like they teach my career path at the uh consortium which is like the big doctoral trading thing in america for marketing professors on right. how not to do it like how to blow it from a good start you know what i mean so i'm i'm a i'm a i'm a warning case study do you know what i mean i'm a prohibitory story of how to get it wrong so that's that's where <laughs> i sit in the academic so i am an academic theoretically Right. But yeah, I was a very bad one. I was a very dirty academic from the start. I, I like to do stuff. I mean, it's a good place to start. How did you go from from the academic world into the into the sort of practical world? Was it just meeting people at universities and then they said, "Oh, can you come and help us?" Yeah, basically, it was London Business School. I mean, I'm an unusual marketing professor in the sense that I became a professor because I really like marketing. Most marketing professors. Uh, became marketing professors because they wanted to be a professor, which is a very different motivation. So I was just into marketing. And um, I'd done my PhD partly in the UK, but partly in the US. I'd gone and taught in the US for four or five years as a junior professor, very theoretical. And then I'd come back to London Business School late 90s. And London Business School was like at the center of everything. And it was still quite applied. It still is, but it was very applied back then. And um, I was I decided I was going to be a branding professor, not an advertising professor. And there weren't many of them in the 90s. It sounds odd now, but there was only a handful of them in the world. And I was in London, so I got tons of exposure and began to get, yeah, I mean, you know, I began to work for big companies on big branding jobs that I was incredibly uh, unable to service. But of course, like any good consultant, you very quickly learn, you know, while being paid, uh, what it's all about. And that was that was how it started, yeah. Well, were some of the, were there any sort of amazing uh, brands that you worked with where you were like, oh, wow, like I, I can't believe I'm getting to do this at the moment? Uh, yeah, the low, I mean, it was London, right? So um, I got to work on Ericsson, uh, Sony Ericsson, and then Ericsson um, when that sort of Nokia Ericsson thing was going on. And that that just taught me how incredibly fucked up the whole thing, like how much money was being spent without any strategic reconnaissance. So that was kind of an exposure to incredibly good people but in an incredibly fucked up context. So that was that was very useful. Um, probably the other big one was LVMH. So I got plucked from my class at LBS to go and work for the LVMH senior team in Paris. So I spent about 14 years in France working across all the brands in the group and at, at the CEO level. So that was that was hardcore. That was great. And 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 that's probably the one where you know you get to work on you know, Don Perignon, or you get to work on Tag Heuer, you know, it was, it, it was amazing what, what we were able to do and how much trust you had because all the CEOs knew each other. So I would be sold, you know, from, from one brand to another on the basis you should get the guy from London in. And so I did 50 or 60 jobs internally over the years on positioning and tracking and brand extension, CRM. 
So I really got to know it at a very high level. And I'm still close to some of those people. Um, even Sephora, which I know has just started in the UK. You know, I'm still very close to people from Sephora. So, yeah, no, it was a lovely, that was a lovely time. Really lovely. I mean, you, that must have been fascinating. You were going from different brand to different brand, often in different industries. What, you know, did you, did you devise some kind of like checklist when you came in and were like, you know, where, where is all this money going? How am I going to sort it? What, what was, no, what, it was, it, I'm, it was really interesting. I'm, I'm a real procrastinator. And, um, so what would inevitably happen would I would fly to Paris or Tokyo or somewhere and I would, you know, I do the famous thing. I've got this photographs of me on Twitter that I've taken of myself doing this, right? Which is I'd get on a 15 hour flight with a shit ton of documents and my laptop fully, you know, with all these documents on it. And then I'd just spend nine hours drinking wine and watching Marvel movies and having to sleep. And then of course I get to Paris or Tokyo with nine hours to go before the gig started the next day. And I have to stay up all night in my bathrobe getting my shit ready. But the advantage of all of that was you went in relatively inductive and clean. You know, you didn't go in with some very organized structure. And then if we did a three-day job on, say, brand positioning, every day I would get up mega early and take day ones into day two and refinangle it and then go into day three and refinangle it again. And it, it was interesting in my 50s trying to do it. I tried to do it recently for a large brand. First time I've done it after COVID. And I just found that I couldn't because I was just too old because you really had to get by with two hours sleep, you know, for four or five days. And, and, and so I've stopped doing that. But yeah, it was very inductive, which I think was the, which was the benefit of it. You know what I mean? You would teach some stuff from other clients and then you would open it up and we do the work. And, and, and it was, you know, I remember doing, we did the work on Donna Karen's brand with Donna there. And I can remember just being a pull on all these examples from all over the world, from other luxury brands we worked on, to the point where they were just badly in love with it. You know what I mean? Because it was kind of, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to do? And we can work on these things, and we'll come out with a plan for next year for the for the brand stuff. So yeah, very inductive, chaotically so in a way, but it 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 usually worked really well. You know, and it was a, it was brilliant to be at that higher level, doing a very micro thing the same thing really the brand stuff for so long you know it sounds like you've, you've been a true creative even though you said you're an academic it's sort of a, a, a very bit of a, a creative trait to leave everything till the last minute yeah, that, that part certainly was creative for sure but I, I guess there's a you said something there that i thought was interesting that kind of almost you know you yes you've got to do your prep but almost if you if you do too much prep you you it's hard to see yeah, see clearly. Um, do you, do you recommend that? For, 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 I yeah, mean, no, how... no. It, it's a key point, Chris. I mean, there's no such thing as brands in general is one of my key lessons, right? So the minute we try and take what's worked for one brand and import it directly into another, even in the same category, it probably won't work as well. Because the definition of a brand is it's the opposite of a generic. So there has to be a slightly different path for each brand based on what's in them we're not doing commodities we're doing brands so i think being sensitive to that and not being too formulaic is i think one of the great strengths and it fascinates me how few marketers are able to move from brand one to brand two to brand three and be able to start from a blank page again most of them come in and and it you know it doesn't work with an a priori approach, which was built from the previous brand, but won't work for brand two. Sometimes it works okay, but the reality is you go back to diagnosis, you go back to understanding the brand that you're now on, then to strategy, then to tactics. Not, I know how brands work, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, that's not how it should be done, in my opinion. So when you were doing all of this, you, you know, where... Where did you get your learning from? Like nowadays, obviously, luckily people can, you know, take your course or take one of our courses or, or read a million amazing books. Um, but I mean, where, where did you get your inspiration from? Your did, Was it just hard 
trial and error or, or were the people who no, no, I mean, I'd, I'd studied it. I'd studied it quite a, to quite a great degree within the academic firmament. So coming up with a PhD in marketing and then having taught MBAs and having um, published work of my own, I, I was very, I pretty much read everything up until, I mean, where are we now? I mean, you know, 25 years ago, there was a lot less being written, right, of, of any note. So I was pretty on top of anything that David Arker, Kevin Keller, and everyone going back from there had written. Do you know what I mean? Like Tom Robinson, all those guys, I knew all that stuff pretty well. And it was pretty good stuff, I have to say, right? So I, I knew all of that, and then I was immediately getting exposed to actual work. And it was, you know, in my opinion, it was how it should be. Because you had this theory, you had then loads of consulting experience, and in the middle you were then doing, you were teaching MBAs the thing you were doing, you know, like Indiana Jones. And the, the three things together were beautifully. But throughout my career as a business school professor, I was constantly told that I was getting it wrong, you know, because my teaching was too good, literally, my, you know, my, that was my feedback. Um, and I'm spending too much time consulting. And I was always kind of pretty sure that was that was stupid. It was like, no, I, you know, and if you look at what's wrong in business schools now, they're populated by delightful people who haven't got a fucking clue about the thing they're teaching. Right. I mean, what talking about that, what do you think has been the sort of greatest evolution that you've seen from doing your brand consulting when you started to, to, to where we are today? Have there been some radical changes? I mean, obviously the landscape has changed a lot, but what, what, what do you think? Oh, look, I think it, for, I'm a big one to say the fundamentals don't change that much. Right. Having said that, if someone like me says the fundamentals are changing, then they probably are. I'm the last guy to say they are, but they are now. You know, um, I'd say that, you know, the obvious one is tactically we've got now this split between digital and traditional, which doesn't make perfect sense, but that changed things tactically. But the, the big one's probably been strategically in the sense that over the last 10 years, the role of segmentation has definitely changed. It, it, it definitely seems less and less valid. And the, the impact of Aaron Berg Bass has been very positive around two things for me. Really bringing mass marketing back as a, as a potential opportunity and obviously their work on distinctiveness. But certainly segmentation, I think we over-segmented things in a far too complex fashion. And I think that's been a very big change. The idea you can target everyone in the category and not be seen as an idiot is probably the biggest revolution that's happened in my during my time being involved. Yeah, cause I mean, I, I, I was actually listening to one of your podcasts the other day. You, you did a, a, a lovely talk with Joe Glover from the Marketing Marketing Great. Meetup. Um, wonderful chat. If you haven't heard of the Marketing Meetup, go yeah. and, uh, and check them out. Um, and I, I thought it was, it was a lovely talk to listen to because you talked a bit about the difference between uh, how to grow a brand if you're a big brand and how to grow a brand if you're if you're very small. Um, your 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 early summary was not great if you were a small brand. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah, no, I mean, look, it bears repeating, Chris. You know, you you you're very fucked if you're a small brand because capitalism isn't fair, and I, you know. American marketers have many great strengths, but, but one of their weaknesses is they have this fetish for David versus Goliath and that small, agile, entrepreneurial brands will win. And it's just patently not true. It has never been true. It does occasionally happen, but so rarely we shouldn't really talk about it. The story of marketing is big brands getting there first when right. categories are created and then dominating from that point onwards, partly because they've got more money, but also because their dollars go further because they're already a big brand, and, and it's not fair. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's hard when I talk to people like Joe because they, you know Joe's wonderful, and he has an, a very optimistic view of that entrepreneurial startup culture. I think, I think it's horrible and destructive and incredibly hard on people and teams and I want nothing to do with it at all. And and I respect those people very much. I have not a bone of entrepreneurial, true entrepreneurial um, 
uh, what's the right predisposition in me, right? Because it, it, that definition of an entrepreneur where they'll risk everything strikes me as bananas, right? You're you're much closer to an entrepreneur than I am. I, yeah, no, I mean, I still think you've yeah you know, you've made big bets in your life, right? You've 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 moved to different countries, you you've taken yeah. leaps yeah, where sure. other people wouldn't have, and those, those are all big entrepreneurial traits. So. It, it, it's an interesting I one. I still think about this. Um, when I left London Business School, I can remember the professors, several of them who were good friends of mine, saying, what What are you going to do? Like, you're going to Australia. What are you going to do? Have you lost your mind? Do you know what I mean? And I can remember not being phased by it at all. And to this day, I don't know whether that's because I have a gigantic ego or I have no ego at all. And I, I, I still don't know the answer to the question, right? Because... If I had a huge ego, I'd have to be at, you know, London Business School and Hello Dear Boy and I've got the cards and all that. Um, or I would, if my, my ego was so titanic that I was able just to leave and go, you know, I'll just go to Australia and do it. Which was, you're right, it was a bit of a bold move. But there was always, fi I mean, financially, I was never going to, I'm very working class. I was never going to risk everything. Do you know what I mean? I've got friends who are proper entrepreneurs that risk everything. And I'm like, I, I just could not do that you know when I, mean, I just not. I don't think you need to risk everything to be an entrepreneur but um I mean if you think about it I mean the original French definition is it's a man or a woman who invests more than they have on their you know on their gamble or so I forget what you know but it's something really masochistic Roman Catholic <laughs> something really dark you know, the American entrepreneur is not the, the same as the right. original, you know, the famous George Bush quote, you know what I mean? The French don't understand entrepreneur. It's like, they're fucking word, mate. I'm be pretty sure they do. <laughs> so so you swapped uh, you swapped the wonderful weather of the UK for uh, for the heat and uh, and and wonderfulness of Australia. And you, you went over there to go, to, was it Melbourne initially or did you go to Sydney or was it? Well, I'm married. I was married by then to a barmaid from the Windsor Castle, which is the local pub at London Business School. Funnily enough, and um, she ended up being from Tasmania. Wait, and what? So, and she was a she was a proper Tasmanian in the sense that she hadn't really been to the mainland at all. So uh, she'd flown straight to London when she turned nineteen. Big culture we shock. We met later later in London. And we've flown back. And I kept saying to her when we got back, you know, what, what about this? And she's like, I don't know. Really I have no idea what any of this is. I, I don't know. What do you think? So she was useless. So we went around the whole of Australia and New Zealand. And I gave talks at all the universities. And at the same time, we were trying to work out where do we fancy living. And in the end, Melbourne was the winner. So we ended up at Melbourne Uni at the business school, Melbourne Business School, which is great. Yeah. And I did, uh, I would have probably done more, certainly more than 10 years there. First of all, as a as a real professor. And then as my consulting kept going, I became essentially a, an adjunct professor. So I kind of, again, right. I, 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 my career was gradually petering out as an academic throughout. So I became like just a part-time academic. And by then I was flying everywhere. I mean, literally two weeks a month on planes. Wow. Partly because I had now the reputation, but also Australia has come on a lot in the last 10 years. But when I got there, 03, 04, there wasn't any work to do there in the brand space. They, they just didn't get it. You know, they, they were Neanderthals when it came to brand stuff. It, it has got lots better. Yep. But back then, it was terrifyingly bad. I mean, there's some amazing agencies there. I think in Melbourne, Cleminger BBDO is very famous. They did lots of amazing work on that. What I guess is now AB and Bev brands. Um, back then, it yep. probably would have been its own thing. But yeah, it's uh, what is it? Um, oh gosh, what were the brands over there? It'd be well, it'd be Tui's and VB. I mean, it's cool. it's it's a fascinating story of Australian beer because when I got here, my father-in-law would bore the crap out of me with these big, you know, he had to show me the difference in the Australian beers and VB was this and Melbourne Bitter was that and Tui's was this. And as I tried these beers, what became apparent to me very quickly was, A, they were all very average, and B, they all tasted exactly the fucking same. And, and breaking that to him was very hard to do, but I had to break it through. And then, of course, what happened then, I took him to America when I started teaching in the States, and I went, look, 
you want to see what beers taste like when they're different? Be old, right? The American Revolution had begun. And now in Australia, thankfully, it's it's definitely happened here as well, and it's moved on. But yeah, the story of Australian marketing for 60 or 70 years was basically an oligopoly. You know, there, there were two big breweries, three big newspaper companies, two big supermarkets. And in an oligopoly, what you get is basically zero market orientation, zero innovation, because the companies are phenomenally successful because you haven't got any choice. And it was only around the turn of the century when the foreign brands came in and kicked ass that Australian marketing, which, you know, Australian is a, it's, Australia is a very good business culture. Marketing was just very, very prehistoric, started to catch up very quickly uh, to the point where that's very strong. But yeah, 2003, it was, it was frighteningly bad. So when you've, you've traveled all over the world, you've seen how marketing operates and advertising operates in different, different parts of the world. Are there, I'm sure it maybe shifts and changes over time, but are, are there any places right now where you think that they, they've got it or they, or they're, they're better than, than, than other places um, in the world? Well, I, 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 I'm not, I think everyone's getting to this sort of global sort of media line now where, you know, globally we're all kind of getting good, which is nice to see. I think the Americans have totally lost the plot. But so I think the big marker isn't the story of who's who's got it. It's kind of who's lost it. You know what I mean? I went to America in the mid-90s because that's where you went. And that's you learned marketing from companies and people that were 20 years ahead of anything in the UK, you know? And and, and I, I, I don't think that's an arguable point. Right? They were just so far ahead. And you look back to that point and where we are now with American marketing, they're off the pace. And I say that as someone who loves America, loves Americans, and I don't get much disagreement from most of the Americans that have international exposure. American marketing seems to have not, isn't driving it anymore. And and that's sad, but also an interesting opportunity for the rest of the world, I think. I, you read, I read something you wrote in a marketing we cast school actually the other day. I thought it was really interesting. You said, uh, "How does a brand appeal to everyone uh, when that society is openly opposed to the to whole sections of itself?" Yeah. Um, uh, which I thought was an interesting observation. I think that was on the back yeah. of the, the the you know the sad stuff that happened with I think it was Bud Light. Yeah, I used to have a dog. I've got a lot of old dogs, and one of them got quite senile and took exception to his own penis. And I remember he he used to sort of attack his own penis quite vehemently late, usually late in the evening for some reason. He would suddenly sort of go, right, I'll sort you out and sort of just start biting his balls and his penis. Right? And it, it's a metaphor for America at the moment. It just seems like an old dog that's attacking itself. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like th there has to be some grace there to realize that I, I actually think Elon Musk is, is a bit of a hero. I, I think Musk is trying to forge a path between the two tectonic plates, hugely unsuccessfully, but bravely nonetheless. And you can tell what kind of media you read with how Elon Musk is portrayed. If you think he's a left-wing lunar libertarian, you're reading right-wing press. And if you think he's some kind of right-wing fascist, you're reading left-wing press. And I think he's genuinely trying to be, like you said yesterday, you know, the Unabomber's manifesto actually made a lot of sense. It's a very brave thing to say in the middle of America and not an untrue thing either, right? So it, it, it's a, yeah, it's a, it, I've seen it in meetings in the States, which I have much less of than I used to have with clients. There isn't an ability to call it like they used to be in the States. I'm not talking about being rude or politically incorrect, but just talk about the real things. You have to have a, it's almost like the, the sort of old Swedish approach. You have to have a pre meeting and a post meeting around the meeting. That's not a way to do business, you know? And I think that the, the American brands are struggling with it. You know what I mean? I mean, the great example was that Bud Light now are running a competition to win an assault rifle. Right, so they've just swung from transgender, transsexual, whatever, to you know, machine guns and assault weapons, whatever. But it's just like th th this has to be 
at the low point for American civilization, I guess. And, I, and again, I, I love the States. It's my happiest country. So it's sad to see it in that state. <laughs> they are a brilliantly optimistic bunch, uh, the Americans. Uh, um, uh, maybe, maybe not anymore, Chris. I've met so many, particularly American women, very talented, 40, late, 40, late 30s, 40-somethings, who are dotted around the world now. And when you have a beer with them, you say, what are you doing? You know, you're from Philly, you're from you know, San Diego, what are you doing here? And they're like, I've got two kids. I'm not bringing them up in America. The minute they had the first gun drill, they were off. And I, I could give you, and this is not an exaggeration, I could show you 25 women I've had a chat with about that. I had a few men, but especially the mums who go, the first time they had the drill about what to do when someone comes into the school with an assault weapon, I'm an international marketing person, I'm gone. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad um, and and unnecessary. But um, well, let's well, not get into into that. Bit, but, uh, I don't know about this either. Like, I've yeah. just, I'm just like, yeah. the um, what what's the um, what what is the you, so America's not doing so well. Which is one that that you do think is doing well? Oh, look, I'm I, obviously that's well. The second one that's not doing well is the UK. But let's not talk about that either. They'll get back <laughs> there eventually. I look, I'm I'm I'm. Very, uh, there's a couple of little pockets of great marketing. We should talk about New Zealand, right? So New Zealand has this pointless little economy, right? And if ever there was an oligopoly that was, you know, Aus you know, Australia makes it, you know, makes New Zealand look terrifyingly bad. And yet we have extraordinarily good marketers, extraordinarily good man brand management, really sensational products, very good agency culture. And there's really no explanation for it other than the Kiwis are just this sort of, it's like the All Blacks, you know, there's no explanation for that, really. It doesn't make yeah. sense, and yet it exists. You know, the Kiwi marketing culture is another one. Pound for pound, they're, they're punching above anyone's weight, you know what I mean? So I'd always highlight them as a group. I think the broad insanity of Thai advertising needs to be talked about more. Um. I don't think I've ever seen more in any show reel from Thailand always delivers extraordinarily insane shit that, you know, that needs, we, no one's ever talked about that. Do you know what I mean? I've never seen a Thai ad that wasn't fucking bonkers in a good way. Do you know what I mean? Like we, where are these creative people and how can we get them involved with other brands? Um, where else have I been? I'm also, I've got a real hard on for the Germans, yeah? So the Germans, I think the Germans are actually a, about, you know, they're a huge market. They've always had no idea about marketing. They've always struggled with it. You know what I mean? The long bit, the brand building bit, it's not been quite years or that. I get this sense, we're getting more and more Germans. I mean, it's a very big country who are getting it. And I feel great optimism that the Germans are gonna are gonna be a force in marketing in the next fifty years. They sure as shit haven't been in the last fifty years, but now I feel like they're coming, and the, and it's a good thing. I think culturally, that I mean, my my wife's half German, and I think it's, yeah, it seems go. that culturally they're a lot a lot less repressed than they used to be. Uh, totally. So I mean, uh, I don't. I mean, I used to say this about the Danes, and it's still I've never met a bad Dane or a bad Dutch person, but I've also never met a bad German. I just find them well, to be more and more engaging. Yeah. Um, you know, they're the good men and women of Europe. And I think now they're, 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 they're a, you know, they're a liberal bunch, obviously. And I, yeah, I would expect them to come on now. And I, I get that sense. There's a lot of people saying interesting things in Germany about marketing and it's starting to sort of bubble up a little bit. And so it should. It was a, a brilliant um, piece of work that I, I, I'm i sure will win at, at, at can this year it's from a new zealand uh mobile phone company i, I can't remember it was the one where they're reading out the billboards have you seen that one no it colenso and colenso are the great agency though they win all the awards right pretty sure it's it probably... is but i'll uh I'll, I'll 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 share it with you afterwards um and you're I'll really selling it chris you're really selling it <laughs> yeah i didn't do the case study and <laughs> i watched it once that was great mate. so yeah. great <laughs> thanks um, I'm here all all, all week uh, for, for selling ads. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, when it comes to uh, when it comes to sort of brands themselves, are there any are there any brands again like uh, uh, trying to keep it in this positive uh, light 
um, that you think are doing great work and really get it at the moment? I think across the world, you've got to give McDonald's a big kind of salute. And partly because the work's so good, partly because it's been happening for a long time, but also because we had all that nonsense about Burger King and all that crap. And it was like, that was a great example of the pointlessness of creative awards. You know, it wasn't bad work. It just wasn't particularly good work either. It was just stuff that wins awards. And meanwhile, McDonald's work wasn't, you know, bad work either. Certainly wasn't the kind of work that wins awards, but it was the kind of stuff that was driving really quite splendid growth, revitalization. You know, it was doing the job. And if you look across many countries, McDonald's, it's a high watermark for me. I think they're doing a really good job. You go back 20 years, there's a question mark whether McDonald's had that kind of future, you know, and yet they've evolved beautifully with it. And I think if you want a long and sure exemplar, it would be them. Um, so yeah, they'd probably be the one I'd look at at the moment. I see a lot of work coming out of their arch nemesis KFC and KFC are also strong. They've just got this back bench of what seems to be a hundred, not all women, but mostly incredibly talented marketing women. And they just seem to be breeding them somewhere. And there's just layer upon layer of them. Now they're going off into other companies but they've still got that core sort of KFC effectiveness skill. And then probably the last one I'd give the most credit to is the Tourism Australia guys, have, I don't think have done anything new in the last 12 months or invented anything radical. But what they've done is just applied the principles of effectiveness, which everyone kind of knows perfectly, and done a really good job. And that's always good to see. You know, there's nothing special. It's just brilliant you know it's just really all well done so they're they're the kind of brands that float my boat at the moment um who else have i looked at i mean guinness is the other great story or diageo generally in guinness i was very struck neil shah he'll fucking hate me saying it right that's how good he is neil shah who runs marketing for diageo for guinness in in the uk when they became the best-selling pint i sort of forced him to do an interview with me about it and he said, look, I don't, I don't want you to mention my name in the article because we really are a team at Diageo. And I was like, yeah, okay, mate, whatever. And then I wrote the article. I just put it, I put it, I was mentioning, everyone says that, but I just put him in 10 times. I thought it was like, a, you know, don't mention me at all. Do you know what I mean? And then I, 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 so I put him in there and he was like, no, no, seriously, mate, I don't want my name in there. He really wanted it all out. And I just thought that was so impressive because he said, we're a team, you know, all the way from, the late great Ivan, you know what I mean, who's, who sadly passed away, they were a real team culture. But again, that backbone of effectiveness, nothing new, just doing it, doing all the basics well and, you know, prospering as a result. They're all brands that, that strike me that they, they know very clearly who they are and they know very clearly who they're not. That really helps, doesn't it? The other one that really helps is, and they know who they're going after. Um, when I did that work with the Better Briefs guys, um, one of the great statistics that came out of the British sample was that, I mean, on the client side, and I've, I'll get this slightly wrong, about, I think it was about 65% of clients said, my brief is very clear on who I'm targeting. So straight away, 35% of them are like, ah, it's not that clear. They don't even know who they're going after. But when you talk to the agencies, the agencies were like, 65% of them said, we have no idea who these guys are targeting at the end of the briefing process. So, you, you know, you get that contradiction between all this rubbish about AI. You know what I mean? Never, never mind AI. Two thirds of the big brands in the UK aren't clearly aware of who they're targeting and who they're not. That's where we are. You know what I mean? That's where we are. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a it's a tough one. I mean, and it's also it's, I mean, it is an interesting time to be alive. I think we're, we're we're going through some some big changes. But I mean, as you know, with with sort of the knowledge that you have on behavioral science, the sort of culture and the way that humans act, think, and behave doesn't necessarily change very quickly. It's a lot of this stuff is kind of caveman uh, era stuff. Well, we we have to put up with. This nonsense, Chris, on a daily basis that the attention span is shrinking and the way people's brains work is changing. 
none of which is true, right? I mean, it's. I posted something today and I shouldn't have, but I couldn't resist. There was some shit, shit nonsense going on LinkedIn about how everyone was using chat GPT to, to, to work out how to improve their resume. And everyone was going, I was 8,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the future, blah, blah. And I just posted a chart from Morgan Stanley showing that 10% of people, um, have ever even logged on to chat GPT in the professional sphere. So I'm like, yeah, some of them have, but 90% of them haven't. So can we just calm down? You know, I mean, I'll say what well, your point, you won't happen, but it's not going to happen at the moment. Do you know what I mean? For me, AI is like the metaverse, a massive long-term story, but in the short term has fuck all to do with marketing. Yeah. Uh, good point. Very clearly, clearly put. <laughs> um, the, uh, we we talked uh, very very briefly about um, uh, a little while ago about Byron Sharp and, and his work, um, and it's it's when I read um, what what you're saying, it's sort of it's always interesting because you, you you kind of you you do agree actually on on a loss. I think there's just a, there's just a little bit of a of a of a of a mix in in some things. I think he says which are not quite right. Well, can you just explain some of what? What the overall, what your overall position is? The, the what... homoerotic tension in the room. Yeah, um, have, you, have you ever met? Have you been out for a? Oh, we were a, lovers a in the sixties. We were lovers in the sixties. You know, went back <laughs> when the war was young. No, um, no, we know each other very well. We've 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 been having arguments for thirty years. Yeah, I can remember going to the University of South Australia and having some data on uh, TV audiences and some some dude in the back row just fucking basically just throwing a bus all over it and me going, no, but the fuck are you talking about? That was Byron and we were off, you know. I mean, I, I think what's interesting as you get older is you realise there are certain people that you, whether you want to or not, will travel through your life with you. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, and Byron right. will obviously be, be part of that for me. I mean, the impact Byron's had is sensational. And I, you know. Yeah. Your your wonderful intro is fantastic, but I suspect I will I will I'm not the most intellectual by the button, but Byron might well be, and I think if you look at a couple of his heroic, I mean, he, he, first of all, it's Ehrenberg and it's the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, but it's a lot of it is is also Byron pushing it. Yeah, the ability to take something like mass marketing, which all of us thought was stupid, and make it the right thing to do is astonishing. And the right. ability to push something like distinctiveness, salience, which we hadn't talked about since the 60s, and bring it back was super, super useful. And the only the only problem I have with, with a lot of this is there's a whiff of aftershave behind the white coats of Ehrenberg Bass. And what I mean by that is they just have a bit of razzle, commercial razzle-dazzle. This isn't science, you know. So they... All this bullshit we had in the 90s about brand loyalty and brand communities. Everyone broke bass went, which was great, you know. But then they went too far with it. Um, right. In, in order to dominate the, the the dogma, you know. And I just feel that last 20%, they always go too far. You know, they've done a brilliant job of getting distinctiveness to be something we all think about. And we owe them a big favor for that. But the way they... they um, critique differentiation is just wrong it's just not right um and so for that reason i think you know yeah but byron's and it, what people don't realize about byron is he has a very good sense of humor um he doesn't take himself too seriously on the right day you know what i mean so he is he's good value he's good value professor sharp yeah i mean you know he's handled it pretty well you know um but he doesn't suffer fools either, mind you. You know, you would you wouldn't want to go in there, you know, willy nilly. You you know, you you could you could get your ass handed back to you on a tray. Yeah, there, I'm look. mildly petrified of him. It's like he's, looking at how he no, you should be how he responds to people he's on a LinkedIn. Properly intelligent, schooled, yeah. you know, uh, motherfucker. I mean, you wouldn't want to mess around with Byron. He's you know, he's got the tools to to eviscerate people. You know what I mean? But that's great, you know. That's that's what you want. You want a few people who are like, "Fuck, Byron Sharp," you know, "Fuck," you know. The best the best story goes when we did that debate. So the festival of marketing, this would be like I don't know, fucking ten years ago now. Wanted right. like a showstopper debate. 
because ah. everyone went to the pub on the on the final day of the festival marketing. So we arranged this debate, and we, you know, he, you know, we neither of us was doing it for anything other than fun. So, and I always remember, and we but we we had a big call about it six months in advance. What we're going to talk about, blah blah. And I always remember thinking, I will go in a really big fucking like I'll prep, I'll read the red book, I'll do this really complex, you know, fucking argument and stuff. And I'll spend months like Rambo in the forest, you know, lifting logs, getting ready. And then I just forgot all about it. And then the day before I debate, got incredibly drunk in some fucking bar in South London. And I woke up at like 10 a.m. Oh, fuck, I'm so hungover. And I had to go to Waterstones and find a copy of his book and try and read it and come up with anything I was going to, you know, it was just such a fucking mess, you know. Compared to how it was meant, it was meant to be rocky in the fucking forest. It was just me stumbling around Waterstones, smelling of piss. You know, it was oh god, you know, done it again. But but how did it go? <laughs> I, really, I still beat him. Yeah, yeah, no, I still won the debate. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't mean I'm right. It just means I can, I can, I can, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I think you need those kind of characters. You, I think the the lovely thing about the both of you is, you know, everyone learns. I mean, we're, we're both now doing sort of education-y things and everyone learns in a different way. And I think you need that kind of straight academic rigor sometimes. But um, I think you also need things to be put across in an approachable, enjoyable, yeah. fun way. And I think that's what I've always loved you for, Mark, is that, you take these very complex things uh, that that often baffle us, and we get too into it, and we sort of lose, lose ourselves. And I think you you clear that that path for us and make it so much easier and so so much more. And, and I really mean this importantly, so much more enjoyable. Thanks, uh, Chris. I, I, I think that's a lovely thing to say, Chris. I, I remember I had a PhD student, lovely PhD student, who I supervised for four years, and when he submitted his PhD. Um, he wrote a paper which got published, you know, in the Journal of Consumer Research. And I, I remember from the very start not understanding any of it. And I was like, and not because I'm thick or anything. It was just like, none of these sentences make any sense. Like, we've got to go through each. I like, what are you, you know? And I remember thinking, this is prima facie what we should not be doing. Do you know what I mean? The where academics still go wrong is if you can, you know, we talk about it with strategy. If you do your work on strategy, with great complexity and great thought, what you produce is incredibly obvious. And in the same way, if you actually understand a topic, you should be able to write it in a way that a child can understand it. You know what I mean? We don't need the big words. You know what I mean? So that, you know, that's a very, a very, very fine compliment, which I'll absolutely take with me. Thank you. Thanks. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, I think Rory is the other person who's very good at that, Sutherland. Um, he, is, he, he is. Receptively so. But he has that Columbo thing where he rumbles in, you know what I mean, like he's, you know, and then he solves the crime right at the end there. Do you know what I mean? You're like, hang on, Rory, are you even with us here? Ah, you know? I don't have that. I don't have the, the old Columbo magic at the end. You know, we're out of the Mac, he pulls the thing and goes, yeah. you know? I don't have that, unfortunately. That's a rare, that's a Rory skill. <laughs> they're, they're, you're both marvellous. Um, and uh, I'd, I know we've, we've sort of got to end up very quickly, but... Um, there was one thing I, I another thing, a small thing I wanted to ask about was you, you, you know, in, in advertising, there's been this sort of, uh, I, I don't know what happened to it, but, but humor seems to have disappeared yeah. a lot of time. I remember growing up, I mean, that was actually what got me into advertising was watching TVs and they're entertaining me and making them, making me laugh. I kind of often programming was so bad back in the day, the ads were actually more enjoyable than the tv programmers themselves yeah frequently frequently do, do you see that's that's coming back at all have you seen some uh not yet i mean it, it doesn't make any sense that what you're saying even though what you're saying is absolutely correct so we know a couple of things right we know emotion is a massive driver of all kinds of wonderful things in advertising and we know of all the emotions probably humor is the most obvious, easiest win, right? Um, and yet, the, despite the fact we've, we've become aware of this in the last 10 years, the preponderance of humor has got down in most ads, right? But we're taking ourselves awfully fucking seriously now, right? It's a, it's a serious business, what we're trying to do, right? 
Um, and I think that's unfortunately part of the problem is we are the, 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 this purpose period that's that we're maybe coming to the end of. I don't know. One of its one of its antecedents is the destruction of of taking the piss out of oneself and having a bit of a laugh about it because the end of the day it doesn't really matter. Do you know what I mean? It's not it's not important. You know what I mean? The different brands are not that important. You know they're, they're you know we can we should be able to enjoy that. And there are still brands that keep that in mind. It's always delightful when you meet someone from a senior senior position. And they reveal to you pretty much early on in the conversation, yeah, you know, I'll do my job very well, but at the same time, it's more to life than that. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's a it's a super important thing. We're missing that at the moment. The earnestness is is the antidote to humor. And and we we probably need we need some form of revolution to bring it back, but and, and bring it back for commercial reasons. But, you know, we come back to a key point, right? There are too many people working in marketing because of other reasons other than to sell stuff. It's okay to sell good products. You know what yeah. I mean? It's beautiful to make brands that are cool and aspirational. They don't have to come at the cost of the planet or animals or or human rights. We can yeah. do all that well, but at the same time, it, it doesn't have to be this earnest all the time. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter, you know, which butter brand you buy at the end of the day. If you start from that, you'll make you'd be a much better brand manager, and you'll make much much more money ads. You know what I mean? But we're not living in that era. We're living in an era where it's funny. I t- I'll tell you a good story, Chris, which my editor won't like. We just I got off the phone from my editor, the long suffering Russell, who is my, you know, I've put him through so much shit over the last. He's published things. He's like, Are you, ugh. and he gets the shit. I don't even get the shit. Right? He gets the shit. So they want they want a uh, title for the festival of marketing that I'm talking about in October, right? They're after me for a title, right? Where are we? It's fucking June. You know what I mean? Why are they asking me in May for some fucking title, right? I haven't even thought about what I'm going to, I won't think about what I'm going to say until late September, right? They want a fucking title. So I told the people there, I said, I want my title to be sex in the fast lane, right? You're <laughs> on the basis that it's just such a nonsensical fucking title. And I'll explain when I get to the festival in October. I just gave them that because I just to shut them up. And then I knew we'd come up with something better a week ago. Do you know what I mean? But I said, all well, my keynote to be Mark Ritson, sex in the fast lane, right? And even Russell has got a good a big debate with him. He's like, now what's this about sex in the fast lane? I'm like, come Can- on, just put it in. It'll be all. He's like, well, there's people that complain about this. And I'm like, yeah, but it's sex between. Two men, two women, whatever sex you want. But that's the sex we won't be talking about. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, so we'll see how that goes. It's that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Is like, come on, you know, it's it's all right. It's the festival of marketing, not the festival of you know, cancer. You know what I mean? Like we're not trying to cure something important here. We're we're, we're we should be we should be having fun with this, or there's some something has gone horribly wrong. Well, here, here, to having fun and um, and. I, I know I'm massively over time, so just to finish one uh, quick one. If you, you know, just personally were interested, if you if you were to have a, a a dinner party, you could have any any five people, sort of living or dead. Uh, any any minds uh, spring to the top top. Oh look, well that's an interesting one. I, I well, who do I like? Who do I really like enough to want to hang out with? Look, I, <laughs> oh, this is going to come across as quite twee and sentimental which neither of which i'm really subscribed to but because i don't spend any time with my wife because we have small children i just like to have a dinner with my wife like if you said look over here is karl marx you know fucking barbara streisand and kevin costner and you know fucking marco polo but over here you could have three uninterrupted hours with your wife where we could actually get get drunk I would go straight to room two. Do you know what I mean? Just because we don't... People don't explain the apocalypse of small children properly. You know what I mean? Until it's too late. So, you know, by the time you are able to... Ha- you know, you see those old couples in restaurants who are sort of 65 and they don't talk to each other. It's because they're just fucked. You know, you think, oh, they've got a bad relation. No, they're just... They've been through, like, the jungles of child rearing and now they're just like, 
let's just sit here and look out the window because I can't be fucked doing anything else. Do you know what I mean? It's just nice to enjoy silence. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'd probably just go with my wife. I mean, there's four other t- seats. You know what I mean? Just unfilled, preferably. That would be great. Okay, well, what a marvellous answer, and your wife will be very happy if she listens to this podcast. She'll, she'll never uh, listen to this, Chris, so it's completely it's, You know what I mean? It's totally waste. I'll, I'll send her those... said Chad she will listen to this ever. I'll send her those 10 seconds in an email. <laughs> she she won't listen to that either, by the way. But you, please do. Please do. Send me that software you were telling me about. I'm more interested yeah. in that. My wife so, will never know any of this. It's fine. It's fine. It's so true. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for taking the time to say hi, and... Um, like, I hope you have a marvellous rest of your week uh, in the land of wonder, the land down under. And, uh, yeah, hopefully meet up in real life sometime soon. And, yeah, thank you for all you do uh, for everyone. Uh, I really mean it. So, cheers, Thanks, Mark. Chris. I'm, I'm just increasingly worried as the interview has gone on that your day has got brighter and mine's got darker and it now looks like I'm in the Death Star and you're kind <laughs> of like the forces of good and I'm like, I might put a black <laughs> helmet on a minute and launch missiles. <laughs> people do you know what i mean it was okay. it was cheery here an hour ago but now it's like you know duh, 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 duh. <laughs> it's it's all good i'll turn the brightness up in the editing <laughs> yeah and also maybe a little like brad pitt obviously that's the of course, bit, of course. it's just a small little tweak there on the edges <laughs> no worries cheers